Well, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm very happy to be part of this panel and honored, and I do thank the organizers, and in particular, my friend, Febi and Andreas. Uh, ambitious indeed, as you said, because unfortunately, as everybody knows, inequalities surged across the planet, within countries, between countries, and more particularly in the lesser developed countries and in the divide, in the north-south divide. So let me focus on this for probably in four or five quick points. First of all, the existing inequalities have really skyrocketed in all sectors and particularly in the fragile sectors and we know a lot of them. And the poorest of the poor have been the most badly hit. Just to give you a few figures, I won't give many, but these are absolutely necessary for Africa as far as the COVID impact has been calculated one year ago in, in September 20. The poverty must have um, skyrocketed, you know, to 49.2 million from 28 to 2. Food insecurity in East Africa up to 43 million and in West Africa up to 50, while the job losses were between 25 and 30 million. And of course, the, the dramatic is that uh, problem is that the mo many, many business closed and the others were operating at their lower capacity, the layoff making, of course, between 10 and 30 percent of the uh, unemployment. Second, inequalities which have been created by the pandemic itself. And we do know the huge stress that was on the very, very fragile health systems across Africa. And we do know here that the shortages are human, material, medical, and uh, equipments uh, to uh, just a few, you know, the equipped beds, the uh, uh, test kits, and so forth. And moreover, we have seen the upsurge of endemic diseases, HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, which could not receive the appropriate uh, therapy. Prevention as well was suffering as well, because how can you confine uh, the millions of workers in the large informal sectors? It's impossible. It means that they cannot win their daily um, living. Third point, inequalities in the capacities to respond are huge, especially between the North and the South, between the developed countries and the poor ones. Well, here, whether be it in the urgent measures, all the anti-COVID plans, we have seen the billions which have been uh, devoted to that in the rich countries and uh, rather modest ones in the poorer countries, the urgent measures which really are meant to save life and to uh, preserve the health, the necessary steps as well to secure minimum functioning of the economies and make sure that we can keep and save a few jobs and entrepreneurs. Uh, the uh, problem as well is in the education sector because of the uh, crack of the digital uh, sector. We have seen that many have um, left the school or interrupted because they could not afford to have distant learning. This was true as well for the small business, but for school is dramatic because the pupils who left interrupted school left it for good. And this is a very bad news because we do know that education is still suffering and not being really generalized while it is a key point uh, for us. So in uh, these conditions, I would like really to many, 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 many uh, different equality, inequalities. We cannot speak about everything, but I would like you know, to take the vaccines as really an emblematic case. At the moment, the rich countries are contemplating to provide the third shot to a population normally vaccinated between 60 and 70 percent. In Africa, less than 4 percent of the populations have received the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And the uh, prospects of the WHO 
say that perhaps 10% of the African population will be vaccinated by now, by the end of September, which is today, and about 40% by the end of, but nothing is really serious. We have seen that Jeffrey Sachs, who is really central in our sustainability uh, summits, have been claiming and advocating for improving the supplies of vaccine, of removing the intellectual property rights and so forth, but nothing has been happening from that. And the COVAX has not covered all the needs, of course, far from that. And the uh, rich countries have been extremely thrifty, not to speak about a real lack of solidarity. They have promised 800 doses while Africa needs 10 billion shots. So on top of that, what makes it even dramatic is the incapacity of the African countries to borrow, to cover the urgent needs and as well to relaunch the recovery plans. So in this condition, how can we really speak of prospects to uh, preserve whatever progress has been we have really to make sure that the collapse does not happen, especially when we see now the prospect for maritime transportation, which is cut between China and Africa. And the prospect is that it's going to climb by 30 or even more percent, which makes it extremely difficult to supply the uh, emerging or to maintain the uh, industrial fabric, you know, in Africa. So how to avoid these setbacks, as you are asking, and how to face the challenges, particularly the actions for the uh, uh, social gap? Well, of course, we have long list, you know, of proposals, especially, you know, for Africa, we have short term ones, action recovery measures, which go from economic back on track, to scale up domestic supply chains, support digital innovation, accelerate economic transformation, agriculture and food production of food security, promote consumption spending, enhance youth development and women economic development, and as well restore trade and mobilize resources and investment for economic recovery for debt sustainability, which is the last item in this. And we have just said that Unfortunately, the challenges are critical and the answers are extremely poor concerning the debt in particular, the ones that has been proposed by the J20 last year. The uh, building indigenous and resilient economy as well are contemplated, for instance, in this uh, recovery plans of Africa, medium and long-term plans, mainly inspired by Agenda 2063, which as we know is extremely ambitious, which goes from protecting the environment and harnessing natural resources, fast track implementation of the economy and achieve economic transformation and invest in people above all and accelerate the free trade continental area. But unfortunately, given all that I have been saying and precisely the difficulties that are uh, experienced in Africa, it, I'm afraid this long list will be simply a wishful list if there is no real will of international support very robust and very permanent to boost precisely the SMS, the small enterprise, which are really basic, to boost the private sector and to provide, above all, sufficient liquidity to cater for the urgency plans and, of course, for a decent uh, economy. Well, let me finish. I, unfortunately, we have very little time, but I would like to finish on a little glimmer of hope uh, by giving the example of my own country. Well, as you know, Morocco has been from the very start given as an example. We don't want to be an example. We were just trying to do our best to face this tremendous challenge. And it doesn't mean that situation is rosy. We are still experiencing a lot of difficulties because we had a very ambitious strategy. But however, we have to insist on one thing, 
that you cannot hope to resume progress pre and uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic unless you have a real comprehensive strategy, which actually for Morocco was standing on three or four pillars. I go very quickly through them. First of all, a very strong leadership with a real vision, with uh, capacity to decide and determination, even to take the more risky and difficult decision. With quick anticipation, this is the second uh, condition, as we had, because His Majesty decided to close the kingdom as early as the 13th of March, where we had only a couple of cases of COVID, March 2020, of course. And knowing that we are going to sacrifice tourism, which is a basic sector in our country, and even, you know, the uh, trips of the Moroccans abroad and the diaspora, who are really as well crucial, you know, for the Moroccan national cohesion. Second is the anticipation and, of course, the dedicated fund, which has been uh, nourished up to 2.8% of the GDP. And it has been appreciated as the highest rate for the GDP in the world. So we were ready to make this sacrifice to make sure to save lives, first of all, and this was the first objective of His Majesty and of Morocco, and as well to allow the redeployment of our productive capacity. And here Morocco has really shown an exceptional agility to mobilize the public sector, universities, research institution, the business, civil society, and of course, with the full addition of the population, which was uh, really, you know, very uh, obedient and accepted the harsh measures. So we started a real reconversion of our industrial fabric to produce all that was necessary the, for urgent response to the COVID from mask, hydrogel, hydroalcoholic, uh, respiration, you know, uh, devices and so forth. And not only for Morocco, but as well, we have been catering for 15 African countries, over 8 million masks and so forth. I don't want to go into the details. But above all, we had as well taken some bold decision for the recovery itself, since the relaunch plan was calculated up to 10 billion euros, half public, half private, to make sure that we could sustain the uh, recovery in spite of the disaster in tourism, once again, which is one of the third pillar of Morocco and which is still closed up to now. We had decided to postpone school to tomorrow, 1st of October, to make sure that the population between 12 and 8, 17 is totally vaccinated, not to provide clusters in schools and recontaminate everybody at a moment where Morocco has started to vaccine the vaccines very early and that we are on the verge of giving the third shot. Over 60% of the population has already received. This is the first, of course, no wonder in Africa and sometimes ahead of many developed countries. But at the same time, the what is interesting in this whole 500 days, there is a book which has been written about that and you, you can read it, you know, as a Netflix series, extremely, you know, with a sort of suspense. That Morocco has been taking some very bold decision at a moment where you think that you can only answer the urgent and the present time, Morocco has decided to take medium term crucial decisions for social protection, and we launched a plan to cover 22 million Moroccans for general social protection against unemployment, health security, of course, and pensions, and restore the balance because all the Moroccans were not protected. And as well, 
we launched the new model of development, which indeed has been discussed for over a year and a half, but we accelerated the discussions, consultations taken from all parts within Morocco and with the Moroccan diaspora and all the talents across the world to come up with a new model, which would be inclusive, uh, green recovery, and focused on research and education hubs, not only for Morocco, but for the rest of Africa. So this is extremely ambitious because it is a model which is up to 2035. We are starting now, and especially we are happy that uh, through normal elections, the Islamist party, at least I am happy personally, has been chased out of power and that we are having a new government which is more liberal with a very good news, which is more than 50% of uh, turn in the elections, which is very new, and hopefully that they will be able to uh, tackle all these delicate problems, making sure that we can prepare the country for this inclusive, sustainable development that all the Moroccans deserve. Thank you for your attention.